Okay, welcome to Buy Accessible, what that means and why it matters. And this is a really important part of our acquisition of instructional materials and how we think about acquiring instructional materials. And it's interestingly enough, there are some statutory requirements on special education, on, on state and local education agencies. But what we know is many of the materials that are appropriate for increasing usability and accessibility for students with disabilities are also very important to lots of other students who will perhaps not be served under special education or not meet copyright criteria for acquiring these needed materials from some sources. So that's sort of a, a, a quick and dirty intro to uh, and if I disappear, you guys, there's a wire back here that sort of is a little, got a little hump in it. I'll get back up and you'll see me again. So I want to tell you just a little bit about the change equals equation before we start. Because when we think about accessibility and broad usability in instructional materials, we're really talking about a change in the way we go about acquiring materials, not just for some, but for all. So Robert Garmston and Bruce Wellman came up with this particular thing. This is not about instructional materials. This is about change. That in order for change to occur, A plus B plus C has to be greater than X. A is a shared dissatisfaction with the current state by a critical mass. I mean, I can be as unsatisfied as I want to be, or you can be as unsatisfied as you want to be. But unless there's a critical mass that says change needs to occur, then it usually doesn't. Um, B is a shared vision of the desired state. C is the knowledge of practical steps from getting to the current state to the desired state. Okay? And X is the cost of change. And that's not cost in terms of money, even though money could potentially be a cost. It's really what are the resistances and blockages related to this change, and how do we make sure that the critical mass is wanting to move forward. So we are not a critical mass in this room or out there in um, video land, but we are probably change agents in some way. Because what a change agent does is sort of looks at why is change not occurring and say, is it because, uh, this is not exactly how you'd put it, but this is because not enough people care about this change happening? Or is it because people don't have any idea what to, where to go? with change? We know the current state's not okay, but we don't know where we want to go. Or is it because we really don't know how to get there, even if we do know where to go? So what the change agent does is says, where are we here? And I think probably in accessible instructional materials, we're sort of in that place where there's perhaps not a shared dissatisfaction by the current state. People do know that students are reading way below grade level across the country, or not, not all students, many, many students across the country are reading one to two grade levels behind their, where they are actually placed in, in their grade. Um, we also know that in special education, we have some statutory requirements to provide materials to some students. But what we know is all of the students who potentially need these kinds of materials are not students who will meet those particular special education requirements. So my first question for you is, are you aware of any student who is not reading or using typical grade level materials well um, so that they can reach high expectations? Any of you? And please, people, be, be, be alive out there. It helps me be alive up here. Okay. Um, one of my colleagues used to say, if I don't get any energy from you, I don't have any to give you back. So. If something's funny, laugh, um, smile, jump around, e learn from Paula. You know, we all just jump around up here. So this is one piece. We know that across the country this is a big problem. Um, do you think grade level progress could be increased if barriers to getting information from learning materials and being able to respond to those materials were actually lowered in some way so that all students had access to that information? And then if they could use the materials that are being used by everyone else, would that positively impact educational participation and educational outcomes? So we know that all of these things are true. So if there are such materials, how do you know who needs them and, wh and where do we get them? Which is really pretty much what this presentation is about, except that we're going to funnel down pretty quickly to one particular way to get them, and that is by purchasing them from publishers who make instructional materials. 
So our learning outcomes, there are three complexities related to provision of accessible instructional material. You hopefully will be able to explain, there's not a test by the way, um, to explain um, how it makes a difference in terms of usability and accessibility. Um, you'll know at least three different types of instructional materials and three indicators of increased accessibility for each type. Locate at least three, three tools, and I'm going to give you a URL where you can find many, many more than three tools. So if I don't give it to you by the end, you say, wait, where do I find those tools? Okay. So this is the piece about special education, and please know that this is absolutely a, a paraphrase of Section 30172 of the Final Regulations of IDEA. The important thing is that state and local education agencies are required to provide materials in specialized formats if a student cannot use those materials. In 2004, when this was written, it applies very much to printed materials because in 2004, we were still using printed materials most of the time. There has been quite a lot of change in both the types and the acquisition of instructional materials since 2004. Those nine years have seen sea changes, not just in education, but in all types of media and how, how we gain information. Um, Ebooks were not an issue <laughs> in 2004. They are very much an issue in, in 2013. Now, one thing that's really important here, and again, this is, this is a repeat for, this little part is a repeat for people that were here tomorrow. Tomorrow, where am I? <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> so, um, the legal requirement to provide these materials is placed on state and local education agencies. It is not placed on publishers. The Office of Special Education Programs, OSEP, which you'll probably hear me use that term, of the U.S. Department of Education has no jurisdiction over publishers. They can't say a publisher must do this. The only reason a publisher must help us in providing these materials that state and local education agencies are required by law to provide is if we in our purchasing contracts put in information that says you must do these things to help us. Then by agreeing to that contract, the publisher is saying, I have said I will do this and I will. If the publisher says no, I won't, which is perfectly within their right to do, that does not relieve us, the SEAs and the LEAs, of our obligation to provide these materials. One of the big problems when we start thinking about publishers and materials is that when um, curriculum committees or whomever it is that's reviewing materials to be acquired, um, if they don't think about broad usability and accessibility early on in their process, we become enamored with some of the really cool products that are out there. And so I come to you and I say, I really love your science, um, your science curriculum and we're going to purchase your materials and we're so excited. But first we have some accessibility questions for you. Will you create the kinds of files we need? And, um, and you say no. Well, what we should be doing is say, thank you very much. I hope that we'll be able to buy from you next year or the next time we buy. Instead, what happens very often is that we love his product. So we say, oh, well, we'll figure out a way to make this accessible. And when we do that, we give away all the power we have to create change. So, and those of us, like myself, who have been involved in assistive technology for a long time, how many of you are AT sort of folks? in some way. If you've been involved in assistive technology, and we always thought we were the makers of accessible instructional materials. We just took that book and we scanned it and we recorded it and we did all of those kinds of things. And what happens sometimes is the people who are purchasing those materials say, oh, well, special ed will just take care of that. So the conversation has to change somewhat. So we'll be getting back to that conversation in just a little bit. In section 300-172, they also talk about NIMAS, and they also talk about the NIMAC, and how what we're asking publishers for is this NIMAS file, a source file that is, that is marked up or created with tags in it that allow that one single file to be used to create student-ready versions. So the NIMAS file itself is not a student-ready file. It's a source file. So NIMAS is National Instructional Materials Accessibility Standard, typically called NIMAS. It's a great 
thing because it's, it, it's helpful. However, it's very difficult when we start looking at it from the, the perspective of the individual student. Because if IEP teams begin their discussion of a, a student's potential need for accessible materials with, does the student qualify for NIMAS? you've got in sort of an odd place because first NIMAS is is a source it's it's not it's a standard it is not something for which one qualifies okay and it's not related to need for those materials it's it's a means for getting those materials publishers when required to do so by purchasers or simply because the publisher really realizes that it is to their advantage in the market if they have already produced this kind of file and placed it in the NIMAC, the National um, Instructional Materials Access Center, then they can say, if you say, do you have, can you create this file? And they say, oh, we already have it. It's already in the NIMAC. Good to go. Now, the interesting thing about this is there is no downside to coordinating with the NIMAC. You can coordinate, and it costs nothing. It's, a, it's like going to the library, in a way. And the books are free for people who can use that particular library. So every, every state, surprise, surprise, has coordinated with the NIMAC. So what that means is when you coordinate with the NIMAC, there is an obligation to put that purchasing language in the contract because that's how the, the books get to the library, if you will, the, that particular library, um, which is the way it helps me to think about the NIMAC. So it is in the NIMAC are these files, these NIMAS files, and they are one source for specialized formats of printed materials. Now it's important to know this because when you're talking about printed materials and specialized formats, this is important. Um, the four formats are braille, large print, audio, and digital text. The key thing to remember here is that a specialized format of a printed material includes exactly the same information that the printed material provides. So if a student has a cognitive issue or some other sort of issue that means even if I heard this or read it tactily or read it orally, this would not be content that was appropriate for my student, then providing a specialized format of that material is not likely to increase their ability to comprehend it. For example, you can give me a French book and I, I can't read it, um, and you could then speak you could read it out loud to me in French, and I would probably have even less access to it because I might be able to figure out a few things if I saw them that I could not necessarily figure out if I heard them. So in some ways, we have to be very careful that when we're providing an accommodation such as you know, materials in a specialized format, are we actually increasing someone's access or are we decreasing someone's access? Hopefully, most of the time, it, it is increasing. A couple of things to know about this is large print is, is print. It's, it's hard copy. It's not in large text on a computer screen. Okay, that's the digital text format. The audio format has no visual component. If you want audio and video together, you want the digital text format. Um, Braille is Braille. It can be either electronic or it can be hard copy. Both of which, both, and all of, these, all of these files, these formats, excuse me, can be created from that NIMA source file. The thing is, there are many other ways you can also create those particular materials. Those of us who scanned, and we're basically self-creating some of those things. So one of the things that, that OSEP, or the Office of Special Education ha Programs, has done is they've not only spent money, as, as they say, they've made investments in the AIM Center, the NIMAC, um, the development of the NIMAS, but they've also invested heavily in Bookshare, very heavily in Bookshare. Um, it is an authorized entity. It's an accessible media producer under copyright, but it helps SEAs and LEAs by transforming printed materials into these specialized formats. For students who meet copyright criteria, it also uses NIMAS it does use NIMA source files, but it also uses other sources as well. And all accessible media producers do this. Um, they use, they potentially use NIMAS files, but they also do other things. What, of, what um, the reason I put Bookshare up here specifically is because Bookshare is an invest, a federal investment by OSEP. 
Uh, Learning Ally is a fabulous, fabulous resource. It has no investment by OSEP at this time, which if you're starting to look at those sources, why is one free, why is one not free? One is free, Bookshare is free to us because we, the taxpayers in the country, have already paid upwards of $72 million to make these things free. So in some ways, they're in included by in, the, in what we do with what is done with our tax money. Learning Ally charges a small fee because they do not have that particular pay it forward support. So a lesson learned, though, is that this is a time of unprecedented change, as I said earlier, in the ways educational materials are created and provided. Access to print is certainly important because print is probably not going away anytime really soon. But it's not enough anymore. Um, NIMAS is important, but it is not enough because there are many people who need these kinds of materials that cannot use that particular source. And then specialized formats are important, but again, because of copyright, uh, they are not readily available to students who do not meet those copyright criteria. So the need or a preference to use accessible materials certainly goes well beyond students with disabilities, and it goes well beyond print as well. So let's think about accessible instructional materials. And by the way, just to make it a little more exciting, in the middle of this particular round of, of uh, funding, OSEP decided that maybe it would be good to change the name of the, the um, initiative from accessible instructional materials to accessible educational materials. For our purposes, instructional equals educational. It's not something different. Uh, they're the same thing. Apparently, the thinking behind this was that instructional sounds more like something a teacher does, where educational sounds a bit broader than that. And I, was, I said that to someone, and they said, well, it sounds exactly the opposite to me. I said, well. If you see AEM or AIM talking about the same thing, just don't worry about those different words. Because somebody said, when at CAST, someone said to me right after the AEM came out, somebody on the team said, oh, we have to start figuring out how to help people know the difference between AEM and AIM. And I'm like, there is a, d a difference. So that's what I want you to know. It may not even be something that comes up, but if it does, you can answer that question. So what I'd like us to think about AIM, or Accessible Instructional Materials Now, is not just things that are created from a NIMAS file, not just specialized formats that are available to students who meet copyright criteria, but that are instructional materials that are designed or enhanced in a way that makes them broadly usable by the widest possible range of individuals. And is not really restricted to the format of print. It could be print, it could be digital, it could be graphical, it could be audio, it could be video. Whatever we are using for educational purposes needs to be broadly, widely usable and broadly accessible. Okay, so that's pretty much what we're talking about when we talk about this. So content may be designed to be used as print. In other words, the intended, what, what everybody's gonna get is a printed material, okay? But there's also, as we know, lots of content now that is designed to be used digitally. In other words, there's not gonna be a print alternative. It's sort of, I was thinking this morning about, with, in testing, that how long, it wasn't long ago that you had to have an accommodation of using the computer because you needed it for input or whatever. Now, you have to have an accommodation for paper and pencil. Interesting stuff. Interesting change that we're going through right now. So here, with co when content is designed to be used as print, we have lots of processes for retrofitting that content. In other words, we can take that print and we can make it malleable by scanning it, by using a, a digital file that's been created by a publisher, lots of ways. But if a, con if a content is designed to be used digitally, there is very little that we can do to make that content accessible if accessibility features were not built in. And those accessibility features, to, in a large um, way, are multiple options that can be turned off and on so that the material is customized, if you will, for an individual user. The content is exactly the same, but we can do things with that mail-label content. That's what we want to be thinking about here. So when we think about the need for AIM, we want to think not just about students with disabilities who may have sensory physical learning related disabilities, 
but also students without disabilities, those struggling readers, those kids that we know are having difficulties, doesn't mean we are not thinking about this, but we're also thinking about these kids. And quite honestly, in this day and age, we also need to be thinking about people who just simply prefer different formats for different tasks. How many of you listen to uh, audible books, regardless of source? And you, that's your choice. And yet in school, we don't usually provide a student with, well, I'd really rather listen to the audible book. I would rather read this auditorily right now rather than reading this visually or in the case of someone who's, who's blind, reading this tactily. So you'll hear me talk a lot about tactile reading and auditory reading and visual reading, because to me, they are all reading. And that's probably one of my big current soapboxes, is that listening to me talk is not the same thing as auditory access to text. Visual reading is access to text. Tactile reading is access to text. Audible reading is access to text. Okay? You may not agree, but think about it. So, some indicators of need would be, and, I, and this is sort of in four different colors, because I, there, if a student is unable to read or use grade level instructional materials, that should be our first clue that we need to think about accessible instructional materials. But, a lot of times what happens is when people start talking about this and say, well, can he read? Oh, yes, he can read. But if he's reading at a, is he reading at a sufficient rate and with adequate comprehension to complete his academic test with success at, uh, aligned with his grade level peers? Because a non-reader, I have to sort of be interested in this as I've, I've taught first grade for a really long time. And pretty quickly, there, are, there is nobody who's a, non-reader. I mean, makes no sense at all out of the, the text in whatever format they need. But there are lots and lots of readers who are not, not able to do it at a sufficient rate. Their fluency is low. Or the other thing, and I think those of us in AT who are really, really big on this particular one, cannot do this independently or across environments or tasks. You know, if, if your access to print is me reading to you, then if I'm not here to read to you, you have no access to print. And that's not a good thing. Um, what, probably one of the most common accommodations that you see uh, is, is read aloud, the read aloud accommodation is humongous across the country. And part of that has to do with students who actually do need to hear the information. But part of it has to do with, well, that might help them do better, so let's check that one. And it may not be something that they need at all. It could potentially be an overused accommodation. But the knee-jerk reaction to an overused accommodation is, we're not going to allow that accommodation anymore. And that's not a good thing either, because that cuts out the people who truly do need that accommodation. So independence is a key, fluency is a key, and then, of course, just the can read or, or whatever. So if any of these things are not right, if the, if, if the student is not reading at a sufficient, it's well enough to, to, to use grade level materials, or their fluency is such that they can't really do it in a way that actually makes it very useful to them, or, <coughs> excuse me, they cannot do it independently, the student may need accessible instructional materials. Now, know that, in, as I said earlier, that AIM doesn't necessarily lower the barrier for everyone, okay? Especially those specialized formats, we're talking about exactly the same information. So, how do you think about this? There's a four-step process. Need, establish the need for materials. And the, and the way you establish need is typically, can the student use the materials everybody else is using? If the answer is no, then Look at the second step. What exactly do they need? The formats and the features. And then you commence your steps to acquire. And here, this acquisition piece, number three, is where most people want to start. Do they, does this student, can does this student get materials from, use materials from the NIMAC? Can, does this student qualify for Bookshare? Um, that's really not where you want to start. You want to start with, can they use the materials that everybody else is using? And then step four is, okay, we thought about the, the getting the content, but what about the supports and services around the use of that content? Because accessible content for an individual who needs accessible content 
is no different than printed content in a book for a person who can read that content. And yet we don't think that everyone who is provided with a book it becomes an expert learner, correct? I mean, we know that's not the case. So we know that simply providing accessible content is not going to make someone an expert learner. So what kinds of strategies need to be used? What sort of technology is going to be de delivering this content to this person and enable them to interact with it? What do teachers and parents need to know? Um, are there other accommodations or, or even modifications that need to be made? The, these are the four questions that guide the AIM Navigator, which is at aim.cast.org. I would urge you to have a look at the Navigator at some point. And now we get to the multiple sources. So we've determined that our student needs accessible instructional materials. We have determined what they need. Now, a couple of things you need to know when you start thinking about sources is every what they need is not available from every source. OK? So, but there are multiple sources. And all students can't use all sources either. So our, there are basically five big sources. One of them is NIMAS source files that come from the NIMAC. And there are two, two, res two restrictions or two requirements to use these files. Whether you get them through your authorized users in your state transforming those files locally, which with the ICAM, a lot of that is done locally here in Indiana, or they've assigned that file to Bookshare or Learning Ally so that they can create those formats that you can use. If it comes from the NIMAC, it can, even if you get it from Bookshare, it cannot, you cannot be used by students who are not served under IDEA because this whole system is set up with IDEA funding. What we'd certainly like to see in the future, if there ever is reauthorizations of all these different things that are w very much in need of reauthorization, is that this access to instructional materials would be in ESEA. It would be in the Elementary and Secondary Education Act so that everybody rather than just the, the rather than there being restrictions that the funding would come from that source but right now it's it's in that source accessible media producers are are certified or they become accessible media producers under copyright so a student has to meet copyright criteria in order to get materials from Bookshare, Learning Ally, the ICAM, other, other places. And there are many, many, many smaller, um, usually for-profit accessible media producers. Uh, also, American Printing House for the Blind is an accessible media producer. Those three maintain large libraries of files. So you don't have to go every single time and start the whole process again. You can get a lot of things easily. But Students must meet copyright criteria in order to use those materials. The third one is the locally produced ones, the ones that we just do ourselves. And in some ways, you could say that in Indiana, the ICAM is locally produced. But it really functions very much as an accessible media producer. Is that, is that correct? OK, thanks. Um, what we know about local productions, especially when it comes down to the school and classroom level, is that there are some constraints on that. If, if, you're, if you're producing copyright materials, you can't take that file you've produced and just share it with everybody else because it's only for the people who actually meet those criteria. Now, I have to say that when I was in the classroom doing that, that never crossed my mind. Never crossed my mind. But a lot has changed since that particular time. What we do know for sure is that local production, particularly at the school or district level, requires significant human resources. It takes a lot of time to scan a file and clean up that file once it's scanned. What we would like to be able to do is to use these sources much more so that here we spend our time helping students use these materials for participation and achievement rather than creating the materials. So we get as much as we can from these sources, and then we look at these sources. Um, free sources are great, no limitations, but you have to be careful because if you're using a free source that's sort of like the book everybody else is using, it's really not the same thing everybody else is using, then that may or may not be such a good idea. With open educational resources coming into the field now, that's a, really, that's a really good thing. However, in that case, many, of op many open educational resources that people are creating for free, they are not thinking about accessibility in those resources. And many of those resources are digital, so the accessibility, if it's not designed in, becomes an issue of a retrofitting to the level that is almost starting over. 
It, it, and very, very rarely, if I've created a free resource and you say, I really want to use your resource, and remember my resource is free, I'm not generating revenue from this, and you say, but really could you go back and put in all these accessibility features because we need them? I'm going to say, are you kidding me? You know, really? You, you do that and you may not have the, the skills that I had, which by the way, this is not me, I don't have the skills to do that. And then we come to this one, commercial sources. Purchase it for anyone, use it with anyone. A key issue here, and one of the concerns that publishers have, is that you will purchase it for one and use it with lots of people. What we know about schools historically is that's not typically what we do if we purchase materials for use by all students. We purchase a, a, a sufficient number of those materials to cover our, our student body, whatever that might be, our range of students. So the commercial source is a big one, especially as we move into the digital world. So here's, here's what we've learned. As the, the, as the industry is going digital, those, what we want to see is a big increase in the materials that are developed by publishers and made available for purchase, and then certainly the, the open educational resources. As we go digital, these are going to be the two most promising sources of materials that can be used widely. But there's an issue related to this. When we think about digital, well, actually there are two issues. This is one of them. When we think about those digital materials, you have two parts of what makes something work. One is that accessible content. The content is designed to be um, malleable, changeable. You know, you can do stuff to the content. not change the information in the content necessarily, but change how it's displayed, um, its size, how fast, how slow, how big, how little, many, many things, how, how, what sort of technology will connect to. But the other piece is the delivery technology, the technology that actually delivers the content to the, to the individual and also that the individual uses to interact with that content. Because another thing we know about digital materials is that, you know, you open a book and it doesn't, do anything to you. I mean, you know, you are free to read it or not to read it, to turn the page or not turn the page. Digital materials really up the ante in terms of how they can engage the student and, and keep the student doing stuff, interacting and responding to that material, not just sort of passively um, presenting content to someone. Uh, the digital materials are, are a much more active presentation usually and a much more active uh, response is required from the user. The book continues to be a book whether or not you read every page or turn the page or whatever. It's still there. Uh, obviously digital content is still there but you can't, it's just really different in, in how it works and I think most of us know that. So when we think about these two sides of this coin, the information is the content, the technology is the delivery system upon which the content rides, is how I often put it. So here's what we need to look about when we think about accessibility. This happens to say AT, it could say technology, period. Um, knowing that if, if this particular piece of technology is required for someone to have access to their content and interact with their content, for that kid, that piece of technology is AT, whether or not you bought it at Walgreens or at Apple Store or wherever you bought it. So, so if your, your technology that matches a student's needs and abilities and your malleable, flexible, well-designed content are together, you have equally effective access, okay? But if your AT doesn't match a person's needs and abilities and, or, or they can't use it for some reason, even if your content is fabulous, no access. And the same way around here. Your, your, con your, your technology works great, but your content isn't malleable, no access. Now, keep in mind, this is about, at this point, about access. And anytime we're talking about the match of the materials and the technology, we are talking about access. But remember that access is just the beginning of the teaching learning process. All of this has to be surrounded by really good instruction because we know that here, here's what works for you. We've, you know, we've decided that we worked with you. This works with you. Go for it. 
is probably not going to lower the barriers that he needs lowered because this is brand new to him. What do we expect of him? What do we do to support him? So that's that number four part of that, th that four-step decision-making process. And I'm going to read this to you because I think it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. The Center for Online Learning um, related in, in their section on teacher resources is online learning for students with disabilities. Accessibility pro uh, problems can be eliminated and the playing field leveled when course content is delivered using various and redundant modes. In other words, it's this way and this way, not this way or this way, such as speech and text and graphics. These modes make it possible to deliver content based not only on disability, but also on learner preferences or preferences. And that was just, a, it was only, they only said it once. I, it just, I wrote it twice. I don't know why. Obviously a cut and paste error, but here's the problem. Many digital materials are not currently accessible. And many delivery systems are not the right delivery system for every individual, even though there are some delivery systems out there that pretty much seem to be perceived as the right answer for everyone. And I won't name any particular products, but I would imagine you all know what they are. I used to say that if we only had a super alpha numerator, everything would be fine. Because this, this super alpha numerator is the, the mythical perfect piece of assistive technology. And what I've found is that someone has created the myth of the super alpha numerator, and its name begins with I. Actually, its name begins with T, if you want to be more generic. It's the tablet. And I, I wonder sometimes, by the time you say, OK, we have the tablet, we have switch access to the tablet, we have an extra speaker for the tablet, we have an octopus, and is that really a viable, usable, Tool. Should we perhaps be thinking about something with some of those things built in? Yes, you can, you can give me a dollar afterwards. <laughs> She's clapping up here. It's, and, it, and I'm not for one minute saying that tablets are not fabulous, fabulous tools. But we have to be very careful that we don't fall into that myth of it's the perfect tool. So the super alpha numerator is still a bit mythical. By the way, if you see one anywhere, somebody owes me some, some money for naming it. So here's the issue. In a white paper, again from the Center of Online Line Services, is virtually no elementary or secondary school has the ability to retrofit digital content for accessibility. So we have to know that if we, if we ask a, a publisher or a creator of, of, of open educational resources, are your materials accessible? It typically leads to answers that are not very enlightening, like, oh, they're digital. OK, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're accessible. So more pertinent information is needed to really guide our, our, the way we do our work. So the Palm Initiative is actually looking at that particular piece. How do we purchase materials that are accessible from the start? And so Palm is Purchase Accessible Learning Materials. There's your other name, Accessible Instructional Materials accessible educational materials, accessible learning materials. Same thing, okay, same thing. If someone wants you to explain the difference, say, there is none for the purpose of what we're talking about now. So what it means when we think about purchasing those materials is we're looking at materials that are designed from the start to have rich options that really increase the usability and the, the accessibility to many, many more individuals. Now, I use the term usability quite a lot because the term accessibility sounds like it's something they do, where usability is something that we think, oh, usability by all is a little bit more general ed sounding. Um, and I, I still worry a lot, and we all worry a lot, about the term accessibility because First, in my opinion, accessibility is a moving target. You know, what makes something accessible for one person may make it less accessible for another person, which is why we look at those, those redundant modes, is that how can this content be accessible to someone who must perceive it with their ears or their fingers or their eyes? Okay, so far we don't smell the content except on scratch and sniff books, and I don't think we're going to see that in textbooks anytime soon. So 
the wide usability is a term that often is, is more inviting to, to curriculum committees and, and can be more beneficial also to all. So some benefits of purchasing these kinds of materials are one, it supports inclusion because all students are all, I would have to say the use of all is a little, little bit um, hopeful, but certainly that the majority of students can use the same materials at the same time that you don't have to go back and figure out what to do. We, what we know, and we've known this for a really long time, is that what is required by some benefits many or is useful to many. So it benefits all student learning. It benefits teachers and it also benefits families because it's easier to plan and to teach and to reinforce and to work with homework when you're looking at the same kinds of materials. It reduces complexity. All those things that I talked about, about copyright criteria, which we didn't really explain very much, and um, you're being served under IDEA. Are they here? Can we get it from this source? Can we get it from that source? If we have purchased those materials, we've eliminated those particular, those particular issues. And they are huge issues. Um, and it reduces costly accommodations because many of the accommodations that we have had to have in the past for a, a small number of students would simply be there and be available to the much larger number of students. That doesn't mean that the need for assistive technology or the need for some very specialized things is going to go away. It just means that for that large group of students, really big group of students, very likely whatever is, is built in and can be turned off and on is going to address the needs of many, many of those students. Does that make sense? When we think about 56 or greater percentage of students with, in, in, with disabilities are students with learning disabilities. And certainly when we look at struggling readers, those are students who probably some of us would say there's probably some learning disability somewhere in there, but they're not, they're not identified in some way. That those students, those students' needs are not going to require hard copy braille. You know, they are going to require things like text to speech, things like making the print larger, make, you know, being able to only look at small parts of the print at one time rather than the overwhelming amount of print that you see on a page. Uh, lots of different things, but reduces, but does not eliminate accommodations by, in, by any means. Well, I really like that slide, so I'm showing it to you again. Um, so when we think about increasing these, these, this productivity and the availability of these accessible digital materials, there's some things we need to think about. If you are a purchaser of materials, this is important to you. If you are not a purchaser of materials, this may be important for you to share with someone else. This particular slide, more things are going to be usable for you. If you're a purchaser of materials, you need to require absolutely require in your purchasing contract that anything that is purchased from a publisher or a developer is, in, is aligned with the relevant accessibility standards that are out there in the world, like DAISY or WCAG 2.0 at minimum or Section 508 of the Rehab Act. Now, for me personally, if I say, are your materials WCAG 2.0 um, compatible? And you say, yes, I say, great. If you say no, I say, oh dear, but I don't have any idea what I asked you or what you answered back. You know, I don't know, and I would say I probably know more about it than the typical educator in the classroom, exactly what I should be seeing in that material that would say to me, yes, indeed, you are right, it is compatible, okay? There are lots of people who do know that. I'm not one of those people because I'm much more interested in using those materials flexibly than in knowing how they got that way, okay? So here's what WCAG 2.0 says. They say that materials need to be perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. I have an issue with robust, and you'll see why in a moment. Perceivable means that the interface and the content must be presented in a way that a user can perceive, of course. You know, if you cannot see and all you have is visual content, obviously, you're not, it is not perceivable for you. It has to be operable. There have to be interface components so that that material can, can be delivered in a variety of ways and, and navigation must be operable. Yesterday I, I made a, a point about people often feel like with the audio format, oh, we just get an MP3 file and we put it on an MP3 player and it costs $29 and we're good to go. Cool. 
MP3 has no navigation. Those of you who are the, other than forward and backward. So those of you who have um, listened to books on uh, audible.com on your iPad or something like that, or um, you've listened to books on tape and you've, you've either been wool gathering or fallen asleep or something like that and you wake up and, and or you attend again and you found out that when you, when you last heard, um, people were playing soccer on a high cliff and now you're at somebody's funeral. What, what happened between those two places? And all you can do is rewind until you find a place that you recognize and go forward. This is not a way for students to access textbooks. It really isn't. If they're reading a story, great. But if they're accessing their social studies book even, which is, tends to be more content than graphs and all of those, if you're accessing those, you, you don't have access to too much. If I say, turn to chapter three, you can't do that. So you're in a, you're, it is not a substantially equal experience in any way to have that format. Then, then to that doesn't mean that audible content is not really important, but audible content can have fabulous navigation that's built into it. So it's not an issue of the content, it's how the content is, is put together. It has to be understandable, so the information and the operation must be understandable. It can't be something that only the engineer who made it knows how it works. You know, the rest of us have to know too. And this is, the, this is the piece I really don't like very much, robust, because to me, it should all be robust. And what they're calling robust is it has to be interpreted reliably by a wide variety of user agents, which means things, including assistive technology. You guys, this has to be all up here. It can't just be its own thing down here. This is like saying, oh, and by the way, it needs to be accessible. Even though they're accessible, this is all about accessibility. So I guess I, would, I guess I would rather have a different word than robust. Because to me, if something is WCAG 2.0 compliant, it is robust. The whole system is robust. Not a big deal, just so you know. So I wanted to, I'm not going to show you this video right now because of time, but I would urge you to go and, and listen to Todd Rose. If you put Todd Rose in your YouTube um, search, Look for the one that says TEDx Sonoma County. He's got a lot of ones, and they're all nice to see. But the TEDx Sonoma County, he talks about an airplane seat and how um, if you make a, a seat designed for the average pilot, that there is no such really thing as the average pilot. He says it much, much better and for a much longer time than I'm going to tell you right now. But what he says that is, to me, very significant is that the Air Force said to the people who made the fighter planes, we will not purchase planes unless we can, they actually, all of our pilots can use that cockpit for this multi-million dollar plane. And when they first talked about it, the makers of those planes said, it's not possible. And if it is even possible, it's not, it's way too expensive. But when the Air Force said, we will not purchase any unless there's flexibility be built in so that the people on the margins of that mythical average can also fit in these seats, we will not be buying any more. And lo and behold, it was possible and it wasn't even that expensive. That's what we need to start doing in education, saying, Sorry, we will not be purchasing these materials unless they are highly usable, unless they are accessible, and things will change. Truly, they will. So there, there's much more in that video that would be en enjoyable and good and thoughtful to watch. But that one statement about they found out that it wasn't impossible and that it wasn't that expensive is what I want publishers to be able to see about accessible materials. So. If we start demanding, and not just saying it would be nice, but demanding that, material, that digital products be made accessible, we absolutely believe that there, is, there will be an increase in those, in those materials that are available. So this is some sample contract language. If you go to aim.cast.org, and you, you'll see right on the homepage a little block that says POM Initiative. If you click there, 
you can find this sample contract language. I'm not going to really work uh, to read this to you right now, but do have a look because what it does is it talks about print, but it also talks about digital and what a company can do to show the purchasers of materials that their materials are actually accessible. And that's really great, but there's accessibility for the rest of us. You know, what is it that I want to ask? What is it that I want to know? And here's so, like, since I don't know, I cannot quote you the tags in a, in a NIMAS file. I can't quote you the tags in a Davy, DAISY file or in a WCAG 2.02AA or Section 508. That's not what I do. But I can do these things. I can seek out materials that run on a variety of devices. And you know what? I call these the show me's. Here are the devices I have. Show me how your product works on these. Show me what I need to know to do this. Um, they're device agnostic. It will work on those other four. It's not a format that will only run on this machine or only run on that machine. And you know this is one of the issues that we have right now with different file formats that will run on the iPad, you know, will run on the computer, will run on this other tablet. This is something that we have to get past, especially in these days of bring your own device. If, if somebody's bringing their own device, you can't say, oh, well, our instructional materials won't run on your device. You have to buy another one. In special ed, that would mean we have to buy another one. But it's, it's a whole different kind of issue. The content has to be presented in multiple ways. I can say, show me the caption. Let me see the captions on your video. And also, you know, not only that, I want to hear them. When those captions are said, I want to hear the caption itself, not just the background. Um, so I can voice those. I can have alt text. In other words, every image has a little name on it. And there are also image descriptions that tell you a lot more. Not, not so much what that graphic looks like, but what is that graphic intended to, to convey to the user. And here, I definitely want, in addition to text, I want those descriptions to be voiced so that someone who cannot read that description or, or, or get it in Braille can hear because many times our students who are struggling readers and who, who have learning disabilities often have difficulty you know, apprehending the meaning behind that particular, that particular visual. So you're building in a bit of an explanation of what that visual is about. Um, can your product display digital Braille? If I hook up my Brailler, can I, can I use that particular medium? And there are many, many more things like that that we might ask. Another thing is, are they compatible with other technologies, such as assistive technologies? And then these are examples of assistive technologies, screen readers. And what's interesting is the field out there uh, that's not the, not the technology field tend to think that screen readers and text readers are the same thing, and they're not. They, they're in the testing um, consortia, you hear them refer to screen readers many times when that's not what they're talking about at all. They're talking about text readers. Um, refreshable Braille, text-to-speech, human voice reading, all of these different kinds of things. Can all of that happen with your technology? And so that at least, excuse me, your content. Because at least I want to know, I want to be making an informed purchase. I want to be, and, and if I'm not the purchaser, I want to make sure that whoever is the purchaser knows these kind of things. Because they also are not going to know what WCAG 2.0 to AA means. So what do you want them to be able to ask those publishers to say, this is how the content has to be? And if not, what are we going to do together to possibly build that in? It's going to help us buy your material, but guess what else it's going to do? It's going to help a lot of other people think that your materials are really good too. So it's an investment that's a good one for you to make. So the other things is those rich navigation alternatives. Most of us know about things like there's a keyboard shortcut for lots of things that you do with a mouse. But now we have these devices that require gestures. What if you're a person who can't make those gestures? What are the alternative ways to, to um, get around in those materials? And then certainly have location supports such as page numbers and progress bars, which are part of the navigation alternatives. Have any of you ever filled out a survey that there was no progress bar across the top and you really didn't know if you were almost to the end or if you were not? I was involved in a research project that a, a doc student was doing, and I'm very, um, 
I'm always willing to do that because I wanted people to do that for me when I was going through that. And this person was using a, a, um, a particular strategy where the, the participants had to mul multiple times answer questions over a period of several months. And by the time the third time came around, lots of things had been put together and it had grown bigger and bigger and bigger. And there was no progress bar. I worked on that for two hours going through. And I had no idea if I was two minutes from being done or if I was going to spend the whole rest of the day. So that makes a huge, huge difference to know those kinds of things. So here's some others. It represents mathematical symbols, um, music symbols, formulas, all of those things in some way other than it being just a picture of that thing. So that someone actually is able to know what that content is, even if they can't see that content. And if writing is required, then are there keyboard entry alternatives that, would, that are not shut down? And see, the reason that why all these things are important is most of these things are things that you can do on your computer. But sometimes a program will take over your computer and block out those accessibility features that are built into your computer. And it happens with some of the most widely used pieces of technology, of content we have. And so we look for workarounds, look for workarounds. We need to not be looking for workarounds because those of us who look for workarounds are not everybody who's using that particular material. And they're just saying, oh well, it's, it's not for those kids. Well, yes, it is for those kids. So that's, this is this key, the digital rights management, which is in this case, a, something that is actually built into the, into the technology itself um, needs to not block out other things. Very, very important. So again, those principles, perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So if we look at these things again that I just listed, if you're talking about perceivable, multiple ways of content, um, those symbols being in different ways. So if somebody's talking WCAG 2.0, then you can use this organization to say, OK, it needs to be perceivable. Let's talk a little bit about what that means. Uh, it needs to be operable. What does that mean? These are exactly the same things, just rearranged in a different way. Uh, understandable. Oh, and this is one of the things I added because I just really wanted to lately. Um, the content is predictable, coherent, and logical. That's good. But look at this one. Content that can be rendered at levels that can be adjusted based on the student's abilities and needs. Wouldn't that just be the coolest thing? If in the content itself, the content providers said, you know, here's what we want everybody to know. But if they can't know all of this, these are the really critical pieces. And it wasn't a matter of somebody saying, OK, now what did they think the critical pieces were that we need to make sure our students get that may have a cognitive issue or some sort of issue that keeps them from getting that larger body of content that just built into the way that was developed was the ability to actually display it at multiple levels. Now, that's probably pie in the sky. But you know what? If we don't ask for it, it's not going to come our way, which is what this is all about. And then the robust ones. Um, so when we think about what we can do, again, if you go to aim.cast.org and go to the POM initiative, there are extensive documents for families, for educators, for advocates, and for purchasers that really help them understand what all of us understand what our particular roles are in increasing the availability of accessible materials. What publishers are saying is nobody's asking for this stuff. And somebody said, well, it's going, a lot higher in, it's going a lot faster in higher ed. And the reason that it goes a lot faster in higher ed, someone said, is because the, the student is the consumer. And the student demands what the student needs. And in higher ed, everybody wants to be able to hear it, too, because they want to be able to do something else while they're reading their book. Okay? In K-12 ed, they said, you know, it's just we purchase it for everybody. And my thought is, yeah, but Johnny has an aunt and an uncle and a mother and a grandmother. And all of these people need to use their voice to say, we really need these materials to be different. Again, lots of resources there for you. Um, there's a Palm Toolkit that helps you share information with others. And at the AIM Center site, um, here's, I don't know how well you can see this, probably not very well at all. But here's where the Palm Initiative piece is. I also want to point out a couple of other things on this site, and I'm going to give you just general places to go look. Right up here in this upper right-hand corner, right here, 
is the AIM Center quick starts. If you are going into the AIM Center site from the perspective of a family member, or the perspective of an, of an educator, or several other perspectives, a teacher educator, what, it does, what, what happens in that particular spot is it finds resources that are most likely to be of use for you when you first enter. Doesn't mean that everything is not open, it just means that it's giving you some, some tips on a pathway that you may choose to use. And if you want to find out more about AIM in your state, obviously you're here finding about AIM and other things in your state, but here's a place where it says AIM in your state. You can pull down your state name and click and there are lots of resources in that spot. The online center, which I've mentioned a couple of times, some of you might want to have a look at some of the work they're doing, um, which is Center on Online. I thought it was Center on Online Learning. Is that correct? Center on Online? Yeah, right. It is. Center on okay, so Center on Online.org. I guess it just got way too long the other way. And SETDA is another group that you might like to know about their work. They are the state education technology directors. These are not people who have historically been very concerned about accessibility. They are becoming much more concerned about accessibility and have just recently put out a white paper on accessibility for their members because they've been hearing from people who are concerned about accessibility. Make sure they hear from you. Albert Einstein says, make things as simple as possible, but not simpler. What we know about accessible instructional materials is that the whole, the whole thing is not simple because education requirements and copyright restrictions do not sit well together. But if we're going to make things as simple as possible, we need to think about not having that be an issue anymore by purchasing materials that are designed to be accessible from the start. So some ways to do that is to attend certainly to the statutory obligations, but don't end at the statutory obligations. Think much more broadly to excellence in instructional practices for all. Push for AIM in the marketplace. Look at that Palm stuff and share it with other people. Um, go to AIM in your state and of course here you know who your coordinators are and what to do. Find out who your SETDA member is. There's one from every state and make sure that you encourage people to interact with that person. And I would say this is something that's probably being done on your behalf by the ICAM, but you need to do it, your, as, and patents, but you need to do it as well. Visit the Center for Online Learning and see what they have to say, because they're talking about learning in the digital environment. So it's even got some more issues related to it. And then certainly introduce your AIM coordinator to your SETDA members. And if you should need or want or desire to contact me in any way, you are always most welcome to do so at jzabala at cast.org. And thank you for spending the last hour with me.